And of course, uh, you're not going to be surprised that I'm talking about the computing because I think we're all getting pretty predictable by this point in time. Uh, what I ha am doing is a research proposal, and uh, it's for a research study of um, mobile computing among nomadic college students. So let me uh, give you an idea of what this is all about. Uh, mobile computing has really come a long way, and where we are right now at the beginning of the 21st century is that laptops are as powerful as many computers were a decade ago, and handhelds are as powerful as laptops were a decade ago. So this, combined with all the changes that have come about in communications technologies, has led us to the point where we believe that mobile devices, laptops, and things like this can satisfy our information needs, whether we're at home or on campus or traveling or whatnot. During the first summer session of this year, uh, approximately 20 students from Wake Forest and two professors will visit 12 cities in 10 European countries in 35 days. Now this is an annual annual thing called the Euro Tour. Uh, one of the professors goes every year. He's been doing this for many years. The second professor changes from year to year. The students will be enrolled in at least one of two courses. They can take <coughs> one or both. And the course, the, uh, they will have requirements they have to meet during that five weeks of summer session related to your courses, assignments, and research and so forth. The two courses that are going to be taught this year are Social Geography of Europe, that's the one that's always taught. The second one is going to be uh, Introduction to Computer Science, an overview of computer science. The students in the computer science course will be taking their Wake Forest laptops, five weeks, 10 countries, carrying their laptop. The students in the geography class will not take their laptops, all they will have as a computing device is this, the singular 8125, which is a phone and then a PDA and so forth. So students, when they are wandering around Europe, a little bit more guided than that, but they will be encountering information in lots and lots of forms. There will be people, places, landmarks, events, sights, sounds, all kinds of information that they're going to be encountering. And what I'm interested in is what will be the role of the technology that they have with them in assimilating all this information, turning, this, turning all of this into information that will translate to the assignments that their professors have made for them. So I'm proposing a study to understand the role of the technology in bringing all this about. What role will the technology play? The way I'm going to do this is through uh, surveys for the questionnaires for the students throughout the trip and some follow-up interviews after it's all over. There are many topics in information science that lend themselves to the kind of thing that's going to be going on here. But I'll sort of zero in on, on four things that form a, a theoretical basis for what these Eurotour students are going to be uh, experiencing for five weeks. So think about these students traveling through Europe with their computing device as I talk about sort of the theoretical basis that, uh, that I believe will be going on here. First is mobility. And that's a topic that researchers have been looking at for many years and interested in for many years. I was unable to tell who first used the term nomadic to describe students, but I found that lots of places, or not just students, but computer users, who are traveling around taking their computing device with them. But it, was, it seemed to be sort of a popular term, and I think it certainly fits what we've got with the students in this case. Researchers um, <coughs> slice the mobility concept up in lots of different ways in order to get at the advantages and the disadvantages and the things that are going on here, the challenges that are going on with using technology when you are mobile. One of the most popular sort of divisions that I found uh, that was used by a lot of people was to say, okay, the first category is the pedestrian user. This is the person who's actually walking around while he's using a computer and it's more than likely something like this, not a laptop. 
The second category was uh, one that you might not even think of with mobility, but it is the user who is being transported, some kind of transportation, a bus, a plane, a, a train, a car, while he's using a computer, and the person's actually sitting still, or relatively still, but they're using a computer and the vehicle is moving. And the third one was mobility was working after you've been mobile, carrying your computing device to uh, lots of different places and sitting down there and working. So that was, um, all three of them have sort of different um, characteristics and different things going on when you think about mobility. The first type, when you are a pedestrian user, one of the, the main things that, uh, that people focused on here was the fact that you can't pay attention to either the device or where you're going the whole time. You have to divide your attention. Um, Ulis Verta did a lot of research on this and uh, looked at what, what is the length of time that people actually pay attention to the device, what are they doing. You, sometimes you're, you're walking and you have to stop to pay attention to your device. Other times you're doing something on your device and you have to stop doing that because you've got to pay attention to where you're going or you've got to cross the street or something of that sort. And Ulis Verto referred to this as um, interaction in four-second bursts. Exactly. Figure that's about how long you have to, to, spend in, uh, to spend attention on either one or the other. The second was uh, when you're being transported. Some of the things that come into play there is if you're in some kind of uh, vehicle, you more than likely don't have very much personal space in which to work. You very likely are going to have to be careful about your battery management, depending on how long the trip is. Um, you may or may not have connectivity. It's probably going to be iffy whether you have connectivity or not. And you may need and may not have a flat place to set your device to work on. So those are some of the considerations for that one. The third one, the working after being mobile, all of us experience that. Uh, what you, the things that you end up with there being at work are not having the resources when you get from one place to another that you're accustomed to having. You may not have the connectivity, you may not have, you probably won't have the kind of support resources that you're accustomed to. So there are some things going on there with the, the, the kind of mobile work, the kind of work you can do when you're mobile in that sense. One more thing that uh, comes into play when you're, uh, when you're mobile, and I've sort of touched on this, is the communication <coughs> aspect. Certainly, you can't always depend on being able to connect to internet resources when you're mobile. Um, cellular connectivity <coughs> may have some advantages there because at least with cellular, the carriers in different parts of the country and different parts of the world have roaming agreements with each other. So you may be able to get connectivity just because of your carrier's roaming agreements. Uh, you're never going to find internet service providers making roaming agreements with anybody. So that's, uh, that's really a, a challenge when you think about Wi-Fi as opposed to cellular. And speaking of information and trying to get information, information seeking is the other kind of activity that um, that goes on, that is a theoretical basis for what we're going to have with the Eurotour. Um, you can think about information seeking in several ways. You can think of it as just the typical bibliographic type information seeking where you're thinking about relevance and that sort of thing. Um, but this is really a broader thing than that. Uh, I also use some of Kolfau's work to um, to pick up a definition of um, the information search process. She said that is the user's constructive activity of finding meaning from information in order to extend a user's knowledge on topic. In other words, she places the focus on the user and not on the um, matching of text to queries. So this is the kind of thing I think we have going on more with uh, something like the Euro tool. And Dr. Solomon just left and I don't a lot of um, drew a lot from his work. He talked a lot about discovering information in context, and that is really what's going on with the Euro Tour. These, um, uh, the concept of discovering information in context is making sense out of what you encounter every day, going from place to place, turning that information into, uh, turning the things that you encounter, your experiences and all of that, into, uh, 
information. Another person who went along that same line was Sava Lanin, who uh, talked about the work on everyday life information seeking. Um, he said that your everyday life experiences may end up contributing to your work just because there's so much overlap there in your information seeking in context for your life and for your work. Solomon also talked about how information structures can be a barrier in information seeking. Well, sort of the way I thought about that was the form factor in the case of a laptop or the mobile device can be a barrier in information seeking. Certainly with the laptop, you know, it's heavy. You kind of think about, do I want to take it along with me or not? So you may get somewhere and not have the, uh, the resource you need. You're not going to have your laptop for information seeking because you just didn't want to take it with you. Well, something like this solves that problem, but it brings along its own set of problems. And of course, the most obvious ones are input and output. The um, input choices are basically stylus or keyboard. Um, McKinsey has done a lot of uh, research on input methods and says, you know, the reason the search has to keep going on is because nobody's really solved this problem yet. We still have problems with input on devices like this. Oviat recommended that you use multimodal input, a combination of either the traditional pen or keyboard and voice input so that you can uh, communicate with the device more easily and not have quite as much of a hurdle. The other limitation, of course, is the output. And people have spent lots and lots of time trying to figure out how to really make things readable on the screen. There have been all kinds of different um, different things that people have tried, blowing up little pieces of the screen and all sorts of things that um, none of them have worked really, really well. Uh, there are some researchers, in fact, Willis Verita did some research on this also, and suggested that we ought to think more about multimodal output. Uh, for example, uh, making the mobile device vibrate when something happens, and we experienced some of that already. For some certain things. And for both the laptop and the um, mobile device using sounds so that you're not always having to look at the screen to see if something is happening on the screen. You can get some other, some tactile feedback. So how does all this apply to the virtual world? Um, I think it's best if you understand exactly what the students have to do then I think it'll start, start coming together. Um, this is not a guided tour. The students are really encouraged to go out on their own in every city and to explore. Um, the requirements for the geography class are that they do a research project, part of which is data collection. They have to design a survey that they will administer to at least five people in every country and um, they do that using the mobile device. We've developed some software in my group for them called Data in Hand that lets them design the survey on their laptop while they're still at home and then when they get it like they want it, they just push it down to the mobile, mobile device and then while they're traveling, they can either interview the person and record their answers or they can just hand it to the person and have them fill it in. And in fact, that has worked well in lots of cases when they're in non-English speaking countries because sometimes they have found that the person might read English better than they than they hear and speak English. So, And also they have sometimes found in the past when they've done this that um, people will volunteer to be interviewed just because they're curious about the device. So that also helps. The other things that they will have to do are site visits within the city. The site visit has to be related to um, the research topic that they've chosen. And one more requirement is that they write an essay, a reflection, after they leave each city. And that's usually by train. So as they're sitting on the train going to the next city, they have to write an essay on sort of what they saw in their data collection from the previous city, what they learned from their site visit, what they learned from all their experiences, what they encountered. And they have to uh, use pocket word and a fold-up keyboard, something like this one, that connects by Bluetooth. This one does with the ones that they have. 
connect with D2. So they're typing a full essay on this small device. They then use infrared to beam it to the professor. He makes comments on it, he's in gray, beams it back, gives them some suggestions about what they might want to do differently in the next city. So there's this real uh, uh, ongoing feedback all the way through that helps them re uh, refine their research, make it better in the next place. The computer science students are going to have a lot of digital media assignments, so they'll be using their laptops for that. They also will have um, the same type of requirement for choosing a research project that they want to uh, collect information on. It might be something like comparing the digital rights management uh, ideas from between Europe and the United States, or maybe the history of computing in the, the two different countries, whatever. Um, so they will have to do research on those topics just by interviewing people or visiting places, museums, whatever they can find that might contribute to the, uh, to the topic that they're working on. They also have to write essays when they're on the train, reflections of what they learned in the previous city. Um, I haven't been able to determine yet how the professor intends to collect assignments during the trip. I know what the, um, the geography professor is doing because the students just beam their papers to his mobile device, but I'm not quite sure that's, that's possible with the laptop, but it's just a lot more awkward because the laptop's a lot bigger and you have to line up those uh, infrared ports so that they beam. So I'll be quite curious to find out what he did about that. I don't know if he's figured it out or not because he's never done this before. this is to collect data. And I have some samples here. I'm, I'm collecting data from the students five times. Um, about every six to eight days they will be leaving another city. So I'm arranging to put, they, they won't be on paper, they will be electronic. I'm going to put the surveys for the uh, geography students on their mobile devices and they'll use data in hand to complete those just like they will the, their, their own surveys. For the computer science students, I'm just going to email them, I'm just going to email them this um, survey and then they can fill it in and email them back to me. Both groups will have to deal with a lot of mobility issues. They'll have to deal with the, uh, the battery issues, battery management, um, discovery of information. I, one of the things I'm trying to find out is will the students with the motor device carry it with them everywhere and collect their information on the spot? Will the laptop spend most of its time, most of its time in the hotel room? Or will they carry them around? Uh, will there be laptop envy among the students who are using this? Will there be OB envy among the students who are using the laptop? So what you have are the, the first questions, all except the last two, are on every survey. So I can see sort of how each student progresses through the summer. Uh, the last two are only on the last survey. So that's what you have for our basketball to reflect on, on, on their experience. So. Um, I'll do some follow-up uh, interviews also, and one of the questions I'll ask there is, if you could do the Euro Tour again, would you choose the same technology before? So out of this, I'm hoping to get just some benchmark information, some basic information that will give, show me where the hotspots are, what are the issues, what's, what's great, what's not an issue, so that I can identify areas where I might like to do further research. So that's it, if you have any questions. Mm -hmm. I actually have uh, two. One, are the students all going to be using either the same laptop model or the same Mobi model, or is it going to be whatever they have? Um, no, all of our students have laptops, so it will be the, the, the same ThinkPad model, the, uh, the Wake Forest <coughs> standard ThinkPad with all the um, software that they need on it for their course, so mm -hmm. there won't be any variability. And same thing with the mobile, I guess. Yeah, we are going to issue these to the students so they will all have exactly the same device with exactly the same software on it. We're creating a software load for it. Another thing we're doing is putting on some software that will enable them to do some verbal interaction with it, like start data in hand and then we'll just start up the program with it. 
it so they would get some of that experience with using that voice input. I'll be curious to see what they think about that. The, the second question, um, you mentioned uh, assorted usability issues as you're going to talk. Um, do you think things like the uh, new Apple phone gizmo is going to change things much or like new usability technologies, do you think they'll really affect the results you might get? It's very possible. Uh, I think it's too early to say until somebody actually sees one and gets one in their hands, right. but Apple really has a couple of really, uh, very nice ideas uh, it, that they have done with the iPhone. So we're certainly keeping an eye on that to see, you know, where is that going to go and is it going to be more than just a phone and a music player? Are you going to be able to do anything with it? So, yeah, that, that's certainly something to keep an eye on. Are there cameras in those phones? Yes. There are. It does so, have so, a camera. So they actually could do some uh, some video or, or, or image capture. Yes, they could use video capture, image capture. There's also a, uh, a recorder so they can record things, uh, record sounds that they hear, record the uh, person that they're interviewing, but they have to transcribe it later <coughs> if they do that. So they would have a multitude of ways to uh, collect their input. And will the laptop uh, kids have digital cameras? So maybe they're going back and forth? If they choose to take their own digital camera, the same is true of uh, cellular service. These students, of course, will have, yes, will have text messaging. Um, if the computer science students choose to take a phone and make all the arrangements to do that, uh, yes, they'll have it. Otherwise, no, they won't. So I guess a lot of that will depend on what the particular student already owns. Okay. Thank you very much.